Legacy GRC systems cannot support the powerful, real-time automation and oversight that organizations require to take risks that matter to succeed. CyberSync continuous control automation ingests data from the IT GRC stack to update controls against regulatory requirements and risks in real time, delivering insights and visibility. See how members of the Fortune 500 are saving millions annually by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CyberSync. Cybercriminals are using social engineering, loaded with urgency and fear, to successfully prey on victims, your employees, or your customers. Protect your Office 365 email from today's most sophisticated attacks with Barracuda Email Threat Scanner. It's a free tool to help protect your business from these hard-to-detect attacks. The Barracuda Email Threat Scanner uses artificial intelligence to hunt and eliminate Office 365 email threats. Find the cybersecurity threats hiding in your Office 365 email right now. Get your free email threat scan at at securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Jason Albuquerque and Adrian Sanabria. Security Weekly Unlocked will be held in person, yes, in person, this December 5th through 8th at the Hilton Lake Buena Vista. We are excited to announce our first round of speakers, David Kennedy, Alyssa Miller, O'Shea Bowens, Marina Ciavada, Patrick Coble, Chris Eng, Eric Escobar, Kevin Johnson, and Justin Kohler. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash unlock to register and check out our rock star lineup. Also join us August 26 at 11 a.m. Eastern to learn how to implement cloud security that actually works. If you've missed any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, they are available for your viewing pleasure at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. All right, gentlemen, before we get into articles, I wanted to give you a quick, uh, just a quick synopsis on Black Hat. It was a, it was yeah. an interesting week last week. Um, you know, there was a lot of debate about a hybrid event and how it was going to go. And my concern kind of validated a little bit with the last minute changes by the CDC is that when you have a physical and a virtual event, what's the incentive to be physical outside mm -hmm. of, you know, wanting to be there in person? It was great to see friends. It was great to see everybody, but it was definitely smaller. Um, like I, I said, the business hall is probably about the quarter of the size it was in 2019. Mm -hmm. Some great meetings, some great content, great to catch up with people, but definitely an impact. So it, it was an interesting uh, couple of days in Vegas. Yeah, yeah, I, I was one of those who shifted their uh, in person over to virtual. I mean, it just it just made sense with with everything that was going on to 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 make that flip. Yep. Well, you know, the Security Weekly crew did everything remotely um, from mm -hmm. from studio, so that was great. We could still do what we normally do. We just did it in a remote virtual setting, which was yeah. fine. And, and, and while you're away, Matt, I actually got a uh, I got a new nickname from our viewers. I don't know if you know that, but I'm now the full package wrist juggler. <laughs> so, you know, shout out shout out to Schmooze. <laughs> that was awesome. That was awesome. Yeah, oh, and it's goodness. it's. Uh, I mean, I think. You know, it sounds, Matt, like um, it was fine. It is is kind of your your review of Black Hat. Like, like, yeah, it was smaller, but like baby steps, right? Like this is our first yep. physical conference, first big name physical conference since everything locked down, right? Yeah, I mean, 17 months. Uh, well, almost 17 months, right? RSA was uh, end of February, March time frame was, yeah. you know. So it's been about 17 months since we got back to it together. So, I, I mean, what I heard from sponsors was great conversations. Uh, quality of those conversations were great. It just the quantity was down a little bit, but they were, they still seemed to be pretty happy, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's dig into these articles. CEO's Guide to Cybersecurity. Uh, we talked a little, some of these articles are going to relate to the previous segment we yeah. just had with Jim, right? Because, you know, Jim is what I would call one of like the premier leaders in cybersecurity. I mean, without a doubt, his history, the Absolutely. things that Jim has done in the past, and when you look at kind of what he just walked us through, you could see the vision of of how he's really led executive teams, boards, et cetera, through cybersecurity. This is a slightly different angle, but I think very related in how a CEO should approach it because we talked like, Understand your thre threats, understand your risks, understand how to, you know, prioritize what's important to the business. I, I mean, this article just 
pulls it all together. Yeah, it, it definitely does, right? And in, in one of the, the pieces of this article that I liked as well is that it highlighted the fact that there was a lot of disruption happening um, with, you know, pandemic era digital transformation because it was a necessity to continue to do business. And being able to take a look back at it now and say, hey, wait a minute, I know we kind of had to knee jerk to keep the business running, but let's uh, let's make sure that we're focusing our, our security folks on, you know, making sure that we did it in a secure fashion. And if not, let's fix it. Let's find those risks and remediate those risks. So that's a key point because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working with a lot of customers now that, uh, you know, they're at that point where they're, they're realizing, hey, wait a minute, I, I got to come back, circle back and check on this stuff and make sure we... We implemented and rolled out in the most secure fashion possible. Yeah, it, and it, I it, think that facilit. Oh, sorry, Adrian. I was just going to say that facilitation conversation we had with Jim was yeah. like, as risks shift, you have to go rebuild consensus, right? And here's a perfect article talking about you got to go look back, you know, fix some stuff because there may be a new consensus of risk now. Yeah, and I think ahead, Adrian. I, I, I think it really depends on. You know, what are you CEO of? You know, the, the kind of company, um, you know, is kind of deter- going to determine what you should know about security and how deep you should be able to go into that. You know, the, the CISO over at, at Zoom, you know, that topic probably comes up in, in their conversations a lot more than, you know, uh, the average CEO, I would say. Right. Probably. Yeah, let's get to that story because it's interesting. So this article says Zoom settlement, an $85 million business case for security investment. So $85 million is the class action lawsuit that Zoom is going to pay. But my question to both of you is, does that really justify the business case for security investment? Because I just looked up Zoom and their revenue over the pat- trailing 12 months is about $3.2 billion. Right, right. Does this really matter to them? No, I, I don't think it makes a big impact to them. I think, if anything, what it's doing is setting a precedent for the future. Um, so, I mean, organizations still need to keep, a, keep an eye out for that because this is setting a precedent. Now, while it's not going to hit them in the wallet hard, um, it's, you know, it's a decision that's on the books now. So it's, uh, it's precedent in law. I mean, I mean, to frame this, I use Dropbox. I store a lot of stuff in Dropbox. I, I don't know how many breaches they've had, but it's more than three, and I think it's less than seven. You know, <laughs> speed yeah. bumps on the way. You know, right. it, this is a speed bump. It's, uh, you know, I was looking at their, um, the, the number I found when I just quickly Googled was 2.7 billion, and even at that, 80, 85 million is 3%. So it's a speed bump. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And it's almost inevitable. Right. And so if you're saying that you have to spend two and a half to three percent of your revenue on security, think about that for a smaller organization. That still may not be enough. So I'm not sure I agree with this headline, which is why I brought it in, because I think every organization has to make a decision on what are the risks associated with my cybersecurity program and how much do I want to spend? And and I can't use a number like this $85 million class action lawsuit to a $3.2 billion company to set the precedent. No, and, and no, yeah, way. I mean, this, it, this can't be used as an example for, for security it, investment. Yeah, no, it's, it's not like this settlement happens and then they're like, Oh, we should spend on security. They've been doing that the whole time. I mean, you just can't have the massive, insane, unexpected growth that they had and, and not have speed bumps. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like I don't think anybody else, you know, could, could have gone through what Zoom went through during the pandemic, you know, and, and not end up with security issues, with surprises, you know, and yes, yeah, some class actions are going to come out of that. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. This next article, though, was a little interesting, and this is Amazon's GDPR fine. And the fine is not related to a data breach. So think about this for a second, right? right? GDPR, privacy in Europe, protect the consumer data. And if you get breached, you know you're going to get fined. This isn't a breach fine. This is we don't like your process fine, which is a very interesting yes. risk component that I don't think a lot of people are thinking about. Well, like, is my consent process in line with GDPR? Could I also receive mm-hmm. some like weird fine? Because they don't like my process now. Right. Yeah. And, and I mean, 
for breach, that's a that's a, a, a lag measure, right? It's after the fact. It's after something bad has happened. This is more of a lead measure now that they're finding on, which is we don't like what you've set up for your process, which could lead to a bad situation. So we're going to hit you with a fine because of that. Right. Yeah, I mean, part of eighty-seven million dollar fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so again, I mean, running the numbers, that's not even one percent. That's not even half of one percent. That that is a fifth of one percent of of their revenue. But um, but you know, this is what GDPR was was designed for. You know, like part of what it was designed for was hey, no more hiding stuff in three hundred mm-hmm. pages of legal agreements and legalese and stuff like that. Like. Certain things that affect people's uh, privacy has to be made obvious, you know. So a lot of people are are celebrating this as, you know, GDPR actually having teeth, you know. But uh, clearly, Amazon's going to fight it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and I guess they, already- you know, and I'd be interested to hear you know your thoughts on it. Is the success obviously the success isn't the fine, right? The success is the sunlight that's been shown on this issue, right? And, and getting it out there and getting the conversation started. I think that's where people are celebrating the success is that now there's a light shining on this and people are going to be talking about it. Agreed. And, and that kind of ties into this next article around, hey, CISOs, do you know what's actually in your products? Because if you think about both of those examples for a second, Zoom being a product, having some challenges and some speed bumps, as Adrian refers to it. You have Amazon in the way that they process consumer data, which is kind of part of their platform and and, and, and how they process data. You know, this article says you, you guys might want to kind of like look under the covers and do some product reviews and check some stuff out in your own software to make sure you're not susceptible to some of this stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it makes the case for... The security team to be involved in your, you know, your product development processes, right? Right from the get-go, right from design, right? And, and having them involved right out of the gate so that way it's not an afterthought and bolted on later, which we know is always a dangerous thing. Yeah, and you know, as more and more stuff comes down around software bill of materials and the supply chain and some of the areas there, look, CISOs are going to have to focus more on aspects of this to make sure that they're complying, especially if they're doing business with the federal government. I, yep. I mean, we'll see how it goes into the broader mm-hmm. ecosystem. But I mean, if you're doing anything with the federal government, these are going to be big areas for you to have to get your arms around as a CISO. Oh, yeah, it's inevitable, right? With CMMC and and you know, the software bill of materials coming down, it's, it's inevitable. We have to, you know, uh, I would say prep for it because it's coming. Well, it's, it's not just for breaches and liability that you need to know, um, you know, how, how your stuff works, uh, you know, but for, you know, for business continuity also, like, like we saw companies get taken down uh, due to the Kaseya ransomware, not because they use Kaseya, but because one of their suppliers used Kaseya. So it was a completely invisible fourth party, you know, a third party of a third party. Yeah, you know, exactly. so it's it's, you know, really really challenging. You know, th- this one, this is one of those issues. Like, you know, it's kind of like looking at uh, like one of those uh, animations that zooms in on a fractal infinite for like forever. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> like every, every time I think about it, I'm like, man, like, like how do you even, you know, I, I guess some of this stuff, you just prepare the best you can and, and, uh, and know about what you can know about, yeah. you know, get that visibility. This is why I go back to my third party risk days, because if I think about this for a second, right, it's not just your immediate third parties, it's the third parties of your third parties and, and so on and so forth. And when we think about risk in a holistic way, how can I manage my risk if I don't understand on my fourth, fifth, sixth party risk criteria? Because I'll tell you where the concentration is. AWS, Azure, Google, because if you think about how many services are moving to cloud, and you think about how many cloud outsourcing services are part of cloud outsourcing services, you that would give you a purview. But if you're not looking at this, and if you're not managing these supply chains and all those relationships, you'd never know what that fractal looked like and when it got really, really big and scary, and you said, oh, I should do something about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, you know, it's one of those scenarios where it's it's a monolithic task, especially when you start getting to the fourth party, fifth party. But we have to start doing something, right? We have to show a level of diligence and, 
and just chip away. Like Adrian said, we got to be chipping away at this. Yeah, for sure. Uh, this next article relates directly to the conversation we just had with Jim Ralph. Organizations still struggle to hire and retain InfoSec employees. The two lessons he talked about today was hiring and mm. retention, but it's not called retention. It's called development, folks. <laughs> and, you know, obviously the survey comes out of Black Hat last week. Um, but I think what Jim just walked us through is a just a different way of thinking about mm -hmm. how to recruit and develop, i.e. retain your talent. Yeah, 100 percent. And, you know, we've been talking about this on this show for a long, long time that we need to change the way we're hiring. We need to change the way we're managing our teams and bringing in talent. Uh, because what we're doing right now isn't working. So I, I love I love his philosophy. Honestly, I really, really do. You know, bring the talent in because they're going to be a, a positive impact on your team, and then proactively develop that that professional development roadmap with them. Right, and and, and honestly, that's that's how you build that relationship. That's how you keep that long relationship and journey going. And ultimately, as, as you start identifying leadership talent, you groom them to become the next leaders, right? You, you have to. And that's how people, that's how you get sticky with your, your, your personnel and your staff because, you know, you're, you're invested. There's skin in the game on both sides. And when there's skin in the game on both sides, you have each other's back. Yeah. And, and, and I think that really, Jason, you're, you're kind of touching uh, on the key thing here. Like it's more than just you know, how you hire, uh, you know, good people and how, how you treat them. But, you know, it's it, it's a completely different relationship. You know, the, it's still normal place today, you know, to, you know, maybe you really like your boss. Maybe you guys are, are friends and you do st stuff together outside work. You know, it, it's honestly today for most people a concern to leave your job because it's going to destroy, like you just know it's going to destroy that friendship. You know, they might get mad at you. You never talk again because that's just the expectations that are, that are set right now, you know, because because you're not allowed to talk about it. You know, it's going to catch them unprepared. You're going to put in a two week notice and that's just not enough notice for that, you know, CISO, that manager to find somebody else to, to replace you. I mean, yeah. it's almost impossible in this in this market, you know, to replace, you know, even like not even senior, even below senior level. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in infosec these days, oh, so. absolutely. I mean, you're talking. Uh, you know, I've seen eight month hiring windows, ten month, twelve month. You know, it's it, it's absolutely insane. The you know, the 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 rigmarole you have to go through to, to to hire talent these days. Where you know, if we just start doing some of the things that Jim recommended, I think we'd have an easier time. But you know, from from that relationship with with your employees, I think it's important because here's the thing. I would rather have that open dialogue and open relationship with an employee where they can come to me and say, listen, I, I feel like I'm starting to outgrow my role. I'm, um, I feel like I'm starting to outgrow you know, my responsibilities. And, and I think I'm ready to start looking for my next best thing. What that does for me is that gives me the opportunity to say, wait a minute, maybe your next best thing is here. Let's talk about this for a minute before you go looking. And it allows you to be proactive in that conversation because you know, the, the, the other side of that coin is, hey, I'm out of here in two weeks. See you later. And there's there was no dialogue ahead of time. It was completely surprise. And, and that's not what you want to have happen. Right. You want to you want to be able to to help work with the employee for that long, that long term journey, that long term relationship that you're going to have. I would much rather have that first conversation than the second. Yeah. I, you know, Jim said a couple of very interesting things on that last segment. He said, hire talent when you find it, not when you need it. To your point, mm -hmm. eight to 12 months to find mm -hmm. it when you open a rec for it. Continuously be looking for it. Constantly recruit. Right. I mean, yeah. I do this with my network all the time, right? I, I, I will always help somebody find a job if they need a job. And I'm always looking for talent that, that potentially fits into where we are today as, as a company, right? So, you know, leveraging that, that network and constantly recruiting, I think, is an important piece. The yep. second thing is around development, right? If you have a very open employee development program where they can get the skills they want, they can put together a business development plan, and, and they're going to get it funded, that is a 
door opener to understand what do your employees, what, what do they want to do next, right? And that allows you, I think, Jason, to have that conversation on a more proactive basis with your employees to say, oh, you want to move into one of these positions? Mm -hmm. If we don't, you know, maybe that's something we can move you up to. That creates that dialogue that's missing instead of the like, hey, I'm out of here. Two weeks later, I'm gone. Yep, 100%. And, and, the, and the worst thing of all is not only are they leaving with two weeks' notice, but in most cases, uh, there's not even an exit interview, so the organization doesn't even know why they left in a lot of cases. Right. right. Yeah, no, that's 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 a good point, Adrian. I mean, honestly, it's, you know, that's that that feedback loop, you know, if, if it doesn't happen, doesn't allow you to, to shift and change your change your ways. So that's that's a that's a great point. Um, you know, I, I can't stress it enough. Right. You know, as 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 leaders, as hiring managers, it's in our best interest to really be on top of it and, and, and have that pulse of the employees uh, professional roadmap. Uh, you know, uh, it's not just a once a year conversation either you know as you set your goals it's it's you know quarterly check-ins how are we doing to those goals are we achieving those goals have have we made it to the point where you're going to be successful with these goals that you've laid out because you want to know what we're humans we all get caught in the whirlwind we're all running a thousand miles an hour and that conversation you had you know six seven months ago may have got caught up in the day-to-day -day, caught up in the whirlwind it's our jobs as leaders to remind folks hey wait a minute remember we had a plan here Let's make sure that uh, that you're up to speed with it. Yeah, and and that kind of ties in a little bit to this last article, which is you know how do you bruise, improve cybersecurity as a team? You know, creating that collaboration and rallying around you know some of those areas. Now, this is talking more about best practices and using things like the CIS benchmarks, et cetera, but. Mm -hmm. Again, back to collaboration, right? The ability to effectively facilitate, collaborate, build consensus, a key yeah. theme of what we just talked about with Jim earlier. 100%. It's, it's an absolute necessity, right? We, you have to be collaborating with the rest of the business because you're, you're one perspective in a very large business, right? And there's other business units, there's other motivations, uh, there, there's other strategies going on in the business, and you have to bring all of that together to be able to, to, to build the plan, to build the right plan for the organization. Uh, you know, I say it all the time, you know, my, my services leader and my CFO aren't always, you know, uh, guided by the same North Star. They're, they're looking at different aspects of the business and they're, they're, they're driving down their highway to success. And sometimes you have to bring them together and, and make a decision together, right? And, and, and you have to become that facilitator. And it's, it's a skill set that at, at that level of a leadership level uh, is is one hundred percent necessary. Yeah, and doing it across the team. I mean, he talked about this, right? Mm -hmm. Building the relationships with the business units and collaborating with those stakeholders, having them help set the agenda for where their risks are. Yeah. He said, "You may not get it exactly right, but that's not the most important part. It's that you build a consensus mm -hmm. and." you can deliver on the expectations then. Otherwise, you, you're going to be sitting back going, wait a minute, I, I thought we all agreed to fund this, and then now yeah. there's no budget to do it. He said that getting consensus on the budget and what you spend the money on is way more important than getting the the, sure. the risks in the exact right order. And, and, and I would argue that getting that consensus is, is exactly right. It's exactly right for the entirety of the business. It may not be exactly right for a cybersecurity professional leader or cybersecurity team, but we're only one piece of the puzzle. We have the rest of the business that we have to align. So, uh, you know, I think if, if, if as a cybersecurity leader, you go in with a bulldozer and you don't build consensus and you come down with the arm of the, you know, the, the heavy arm and say, this is what we're doing and how we're doing it, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to undermine the relationship. And, and ultimately, when, you, when that relationship's, you know, not a, a strong one, you're going to have business unit leaders going to the CEO saying, we're not doing this, right? And it, it'll completely yeah. undermine any strategy you have. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, I, I keep using these boat analogies and, and rowing analogies, but, um, I, you know, I think it works here. You know, if everybody's rowing in the same direction, if it's the wrong direction, you can just change direction. But if everybody's right. rowing in a different direction, you just go nowhere, no, nowhere regardless of what you do. Yeah. 
True. And, and the other thing I thought he was interesting, the Mass Mutual story um, about, you know, how he recruited and hired the talent, you know, and, and kind of put them in different roles. One was more of a BSO, one was, you know, doing other pieces so that you could continue that business collaboration. It also set you up for who potentially would fill that role if, if the CISO right. ever left. Now, in his case, he knew he was going to retire. But think about that as an organization. Tie these all back into the conversation around these articles is recruit, retain, collaborate, build consensus. That puts you in a much better position as an organization mm -hmm. when you do have a change in leadership. That will go a long, long way. Yep. Like Jim said, it builds yeah. resilience, and that's the key. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. And we'll see you next week on Business Security Weekly.